Welcome everyone to this Force Friday. Uh, today we're going to be talking about how do you stay on model, right? It's definitely something that has uh, plagued my drawing existence, as I'm sure it has many of you as well. Um, so today I'm going to share with you secrets that I've learned over the years um, in trying to tackle this issue. Um, Ratunje and Swenley will be here to, to back up as well and talk about their experiences. Um, I have artwork to show you from the past, and I'm going to actually try to illustrate some tricks for you, um, as will the other guys. So uh, with that, let's uh, welcome our other force instructors. Uh, how are you guys doing? How's it going, Ratunje? It's going good. How are you, Mike? Good. Yeah, doing well. And Swenley? Yeah, awesome. This is one of my favorite subjects, so very excited yes. for this session. <laughs> I'll bet. Yeah, it's going to be fun. <laughs> All right, so let's do it, everyone, right? We've got an hour, and as we know, it always goes by super, super fast. Uh, so welcome to those of you here also uh, out in the audience. As always, um, feel free to write any questions that you may have in the live chat. We'll be answering. We do read, obviously, what you're saying uh, and try to respond as fast as we can. Uh, a couple of other things. Um, let's see. Albert is still out there, by the way. <laughs> so if anyone's interested. Um, and still, let's not forget that the likes over here, if we break 200, we do have a prize for you, right? So uh, try to stay on top of the likes. If we can break that 200, that would be awesome. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else new really going on. I don't think so. I think everything else is pretty much the way it's been. So how to stay on model, right? First of all, this artwork that we're looking at here, this is from a mentored session with me with a student named Batista. Uh, and he's doing his own comic book or is doing his own comic. And he wanted to start understanding the characters. And I wanted him to be aware, you know, I think that uh, what we want to do is really figure out what they look like. If you're going to draw something over and over again, you really need to understand it in a full like 360. doesn't matter if it's a car, a lamp, um, an animal, you know, or a character or person. Uh, if you want to really stay on track with it and be able to keep it on model, then you need to understand it in the round, right? Which leads us to what you're looking at here, which is an industry. Uh, norm, uh, something called the turnaround. Um, when games, we used to call this orthographic projections, a little more technical. And there are all kinds of varieties of turnarounds, or orthographic projections. I've seen in um, TV, for instance, TV animation, sometimes they'll have the character's feet on, on a subtle uh, perspective angle, almost like they're on a dais, you know, like on a, on a round turn turnaround, basically, on a turnstile. Um, in games, uh, which is usually the, more the way I teach my students because it's more difficult <laughs> and it's more accurate, uh, usually everything lines up perfectly from left to right, right? Like all the lines are perfectly aligned. So the feet here, for instance, you can see uh, in Baptista's design, you can see we have a front view, right? And we have a side view, but notice also there's a three quarter view and both of the soles of the, you know, both feet are flat on the ground. So you're dealing with almost like this 50 millimeter camera. Everything is super flat, super graphic, and yet you're turning the thing at the same time. And that's a little challenging, a little challenging to keep aware of the flat graphicness of it and still rotate at the same time. You know, but once you start understanding all of this, this allows him, right? This allowed Batista to go in and start drawing this character for all, from all different poses. And I love abstraction. So you're seeing a lot of color coding going on here as really just very generic, big proportional abstract shapes. It's like, what is the shape of her head? It's this kind of box, right? And you'll see from the front view in this three quarter, that box would actually get narrower and narrower, right? To the side. So, um, you know, you can see here, like what's just the simple red box of understanding from the crotch down to the feet. Like, what does that proportion actually look like? When you have a box, I think seeing a solid box is a lot easier to see than it is to look at the line art, right? So you want to kind of see past line and see abstraction of just pure proportion, right? Shape for proportion. And that's really all that's going on there. Okay. So that's what's this first page. And like I said, I think, I think what I want to do today is kind of start showing you like, how does this all happen, right? 
So here's our first character, <laughs> right? The bowling ball, the bowling ball character. I figured we'd start really simple and be aware of just how complex even uh, something like this bowling ball is, right? Forget about the pattern of the bowling ball, right? That would be a whole other challenge in itself. And in 3D, not such a big deal, right? Because you could just map uh, the texture map to this uh, sphere and that would take care of itself. Uh, in 2D, they would probably not do this. You might have maybe some kind of pattern or some stripes on it, but they'd be very um, minimalized. So you don't have to 2D animate and in between all of this stuff, right? Um, but what I wanted to go through here with you is just like an assessment of this bowling ball. Like, how do we break it down? Well, first of all, we can see it's a circle, right? But if, let's say my job was to create a turnaround of this bowling ball, there's a lot of different things I have to look at, right? I'd have to figure out, like, I would probably start with, like, where is the middle of this bowling ball? You know, like, how does that work, right? And see, like, what it looks like for me to cut it in half. I'd want to see what is the positive and negative, well, what's the negative, let's say, shape between the bowling ball on one side and then the bowling ball, the holes for the bowling ball, the finger holes on the other side. I'd want to get a sense of what the size of each hole is, right? From left to right, you know, top to bottom and left to right for each one. Notice that they're slightly different sizes, right? It looks like this one's a little bigger, this one's a little smaller. So I'd have to be aware of like, what is this compared to this? And then notice that this, the thumb hole is not perfectly like aligned with the other guys. There's asymmetry going on here, right? So we'd suddenly have to be aware of like, where is this compared to this? And I would probably triangulate this to tell you the truth. I would probably go through and do something like this. And through a simple shape, like a triangle, I would use that geometry to help map what this ball looks like as it turns, right? So as an example, now this is a circle. So I'm gonna cheat here instead of drawing it, what I could do very easily instead to create a round shape is just go over here and I would probably create a shape of this and say, um, whoops, there we go. All right, I would do this. So I have this perfectly round shape. Um, and then I would have to figure this stuff out. I'd say, okay, you know, if I'm gonna turn the ball, this straight line that's here right now would end up not being straight anymore, right? It would end up being, let's say something like this. And if it were to be like this, I'd have to figure out, okay, where's my triangle, right? Where's the center from one side to the other side of that triangle? How does it, you know, lay itself down on the ball? On the ball, by the way, I would also want to find out like, where is this center hole, you know, compared to uh, the bottom of the ball, right? Like this distance, kind of architectural or, you know, it's like mechanical drawing, right? Uh, you know, like what is, what is X? Right. What is it over here from this point of view too? right from the top to the bottom? It's basically in short, a lot of measuring. Right. It's no accident that, you know, let's say an older 2D Disney animated film has characters that stay on model most of the time. Sometimes things slide around a little bit, but everyone's doing their best to try to stay on model. And it's because everything is like measured out. Right. And there's all kinds of like little rules even beyond the measuring that you got to watch out for. And we're going to talk more about that today. So I just wanted to show you with this example of something like a bowling ball, which looks like, man, that should be a cakewalk. It's not, you know, it's like, you really got to be aware of um, how you're going to bring um, measurement. What I've done here, just to be clear, is I've taken measuring, so measure, and I've led, it's good if I can spell, M-E-A-S-U-R-E. -E. I've taken measure and I turned measure into shape, right? Just to, just to be clear about what I just did, right? I created the measurements into something a little more abstract, a little easier for me to track, right? So I could see it and then say, well, this hole would be here and this hole would be here and this one would be down here, right? Based on me creating an abstraction off of it. If there were markings on the ball, I would try to have to figure out a way to map those markings on the ball. If you look at the older Disney films, the way the costumes are done, or let's say it was 101 Dalmatians, you had dogs with markings on them or spots. 
that stuff is mapped out, you know, like the animators and the character designers need to create the, the map of where those spots are to hand off to the animators. So those spots always end up in the same location, you see? So this is sort of the short of, you know, I just want to present the simplicity of something like a bowling ball still needs a ton of work, you know? Uh, when you are doing turns, and we'll talk more about this also, usually uh, what you're talking about is uh, front view, side view, right? Uh, three quarter, uh, back. Sometimes you'll also have a three quarter back. Right, so these are usually, I'll put this one as, as an extra. So you'll typically have these four views, right? One through four. Can I add something to the measuring? Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, something I realized is like, here's where like developing your eye, uh, for example, to figure drawing comes in handy because you know, if the only way you know to measure is like a that stall and holding out your pencil, like you're going to run into trouble here. No, so it is like a, a, a developed eye and just seeing positive and negative shapes come in really handy, you know, to enable you to pull out this stuff. Yeah, positive and negatives, uh, creating abstractions, right? You're creating geometry out of points that work for you, right, to do this. I'm basically creating geometry out of this. And I think character design is a lot of geometry, quite frankly. And not to scare you guys off because I cheated through geometry, <laughs> all right? Uh, here I am to, to, to be witness to that, but that is what we're doing. Like I'm having to create my own math, my own shapes and being able to map them to a three-dimensional object, which isn't three-dimensional, it's two-dimensional. It's just me drawing, right? So, so getting back to this, you usually have front view, side view, three-quarter and back. And one thing I, I wasn't planning on talking about, but now that I'm here, uh, one of the questions I get asked a lot is like, well, how do I go and do that, right? Like, how do I do it? So. Um, first of all, when you have characters, uh, you're going to have a lot of these lines. These are like projection lines, right? Uh, and when you do the front view, really, you only need to draw half the character. Now, you can rough out the whole character, but when you're drawing a character, you really only need to draw half from the front to get um, and then flip it. Now, if the character is asymmetrical in their costuming or whatever, then, of course, that doesn't work, right? Let's say I put a sash across them or something like that. That has to cross the whole character. Otherwise I can rough out the whole thing, but then I usually go back and copy and paste one half and flip it over to the other. So I have the symmetry that I want, right? Um, the reason that I bring this up or I'm even doodling this is the real point I wanna to get to is what's the order of these things. I would usually do, um, do the front and then from the front, right, you start doing these extension lines, right, these registrations out like crazy across here, right? Like, where's the chin? Where's the nose? Where's the eyes, right? Where's the shoulders? Where's the chest? Where's the belly button? Where's the waistline? Where's the crotch? Where's the, you know, where's the knees? Where's the tips of the fingers? Where's the ankles? Where's the feet? And so on and so on, right? So you have all these measurements that you're pulling out across the rest of your sheet. So from front, I would go to side. All right now sides really interesting because it's very different from the front this could be alien right and if it's alien you know this head is like this here but guess what in the side view sure i said i have to get from here to here but maybe the side view looks like this all right so whoa that gives you a totally different proportion right all of a sudden it's like looks really small in the front huge in the side I want this, right? I want front and side first because of this, right? Because of this issue. Maybe, you know, they look really thin over here, but maybe uh, they're not, right? Maybe the shape of the body is something like this. You see? So, you you know, this is like, this is beer belly alien, <laughs> right? Yeah, this is after all the, the alien had to go through all the bullshit on the ship that he had to go through. <laughs> Right, stressed out, went home, had some some beers on his alien planet. So here might be what the alien looks like from the side view. You need these two views to basically get the three quarter. That's what I'm getting at here with order. I would do number one, number two, number three, right? Three quarter view then is the trickiest one because I really have to almost split the distance on this in half and say, well, it's from here to here. What is half of that? 
you know, I'm going to cut that distance in half. And I have to start thinking more about a box with a turning edge, right? And be able to break this down still to the proportions of these registration marks. And that's, that's what's tricky. You know, you've got this challenge now of how do I, how do I do that? You know, how do I stay within these like strong guidelines that have been created? And, and remember the perspective's flat. So I'm trying not to angle up or down. Like I can add all this crazy perspective in there. All those moments are staying flat, 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 right? Now, once you have all this, this is probably the hardest one I would say. Back view um, is pretty easy because you could literally copy and paste your front view and put it over here, right? Here, let's do that. So I would take this, say copy, paste, and say, there's my back view. I just now have to invert it, right? So kind of weird. It takes a little while to get used to that, but this is now the back of the head. Sure, there's things maybe I wouldn't see, like, oh, the alien's head actually is shorter here in the back, right? It's like this, and then it goes down to the jaw, right? So we have this hole underneath. Maybe he's got some kind of, I don't know, some kind of object on his back that I can't see on the front, but it's on the back and I saw it in the side view, right? I have to bring that over here, you see? So that's like the steps I would go through. And then you have three quarter back, which you can invert again. You can invert a silhouette, right? Because it's just a silhouette. You can invert the silhouette and then you just have to flip the perspective, right? It's the same thing as saying, you know, if I have a shape that's like this, right? This is the silhouette. Is the shape coming out towards us towards the bottom, right? Silhouette hasn't changed. Or is it coming out towards me at the top, right? Same shape. I'm just flipping the perspective inside the shape, right? And that's what happens when you do this front to back or three quarter front to three quarter back view. Also a little bit of a mind game, um, but that's, that's at least how I did it. And that got me through, I've done hundreds of these turnarounds in my life, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, and that's how I would get through these things very quickly. Okay. So that's a good, really quick, brief overview of just like creating turns, right? Turnarounds, orthographic projections, right? Um, so what I want you to learn here from this bowling ball um, step and what I just told you with the uh, turn is really what we're doing is it's a combination of force and form comes to shape. And we've talked about this quite a bit. We talked about this, I think, even just last week with the caricature stuff. Um, shape is like sort of the ultimate fix, because if you really know force, you're making forceful shapes. And if you understand form and perspective, you can simplify that structure down to just shape, right? So I brought this little video in here. Let me open up the timeline. Um, one of the things that I do with students um, at drawingforce.com that all of us teach is uh, we use these infinity figures to help clear or clarify uh, how to draw structure and form in the body because they have some pretty clear um, edges on them. Today, I'm bringing it in for a slightly more specific reason. I want you guys to think, you know, when you're drawing a character, you have to be able to imagine that character just like I'm doing this turn with this figure, right, with this Han Solo toy, right? Can you actually, you know, go and think about this character in the round, right? Like literally understand the space of it, right? When Han Solo is facing us this way, the gun is in his shoulder, right? Yet if I, and that might be the front view, Right. When I get here, I have to understand how much negative space was just created between his face and the back of the gun. Right. So there's this, again, two dimensionality to three dimensionality. The shapes can help create the forms and the perspectives. I have to understand the forces that are driving through this character uh, to make sure it's fluid and drawn well. Right. <clears throat> but I just want you to see this. You know, I want you to get a sense of damn, this is what I need to understand to draw a character and stay on model. I really need to understand it well enough in three-dimensional space. Now, on a side note, no one's stopping you from actually sculpting a character. If you're doing a comic or your own animated film, you know, at Disney, that's what they would do, right? They would have always a sculptor or two on staff that would create something called maquettes. Maquettes are sculptures, right? And these sculpt, you know, there would be sculptures of the full cast of animated characters and every animator would get one of these, right? So they can literally pick them up and look at them from different perspectives and say, okay, I've got to draw a Han Solo. Imagine we had Han Solo, we each had this toy, we could animate him, right? We have this figure, so we can pick them up and look at them from different angles and that helps, right? It helps to actually have the physical thing. If you don't, 
you've got to understand how to draw well enough and do a good enough turnaround and keep drawing that character in different angles until you fully understand them, okay? Okay, uh, any questions so far from, from you guys or from, um, from the live chat that I should answer before I move I forward? I have a question. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, we are just like talking about one, like designing character, right? Just like doing a turnaround of it. And I was really bad at uh, like, uh, like, you know, like balancing the volume between like animation. So my teacher always used to say that, oh my God, you're just like good at this, like the forceful thing, but you know, your volume is just like lost. So you made one character and then you complete the animation, just like end up with another character because right. of all the volumes. So, I mean, not a question, but I just like want to like salute those animators just like you and other ones who just like how now, how structurally they are good, you know, how good they are at drawing, you know, to really yeah. balance that structure out and the whole, whole animation and still like sticking to that model. So, I mean, yes, like how do they do it? I mean, if I have one, I have a question with you, like how do you do it? Like, especially with animators like you and Glenn Keane, who's just like drawing like really aggressive. So is there something that you just came into practice or I think it just made that just put like a bead of sweat on my forehead, putting my name and Glenn's in the same <laughs> sentence. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm by no means a great animator, but so um, yeah, Tim Rutunjay's point, which is is kind of a great segue. Uh, let me close this up. I'll jump up here a little further. Uh, you know, the challenge here is, as as probably most of you know at this point, like my career, well, my real career freelancing in art started at Disney Consumer Products while I was in school. I was finishing up senior year. And then after school, I got into Disney animation. And I found out I got in in around March and I was going to be going down to the Florida studio um, for the internship in September, I believe. So between March and September, I suffered uh, imposter syndrome <laughs> for many months. I thought I'm going to be the guy that's going to tank the movie. You know, like it's going to be me, right? Like I'm going to go in there. I'm going to work on some film, and Simba's eyeball is going to be floating all over his face, and no one's going to catch it. And somehow it's going to end up on the big screen, and then they'll come back to me, <laughs> all right? And I'll be put on the world stage as like the world's worst animator. You know, like everything you can possibly imagine <laughs> going wrong. But, you know, and I did think this, I really did think like, I don't, I don't know how to do this. Maybe, maybe they missed something in my portfolio. Maybe I shouldn't be going down. Maybe I shouldn't have gotten this internship. And this is the stuff that saves everyone, right? So here's a Simba um, head sheet. Ironically, this was done, uh, this sheet has a date on it, which is October of 1993, of 1993. I started in September of 1993, right? Maybe they did this because I showed up. I don't, I don't know, <laughs> All right? But I was in the internship while this was made, right? And Lion King was going into full swing production. And I started working on Lion King itself in January of 94, right? So this was then already created by the time I came on. And there's tons of these kinds of sheets. You know, and if you really start looking around, this is not a super simple one either. This has a little bit more complexity in it. You know, it's like, make sure the lower jaw connects to the cranium on the far side, right? Note the gap between the cheek line and the sphere of the cranium. You see, you're looking through here. Here's the shape of the circle of the head. And here, here's a shape that you're seeing because of your x-ray vision, right? So again, it's like geometry. You're trying to figure out how am I going to make up shapes that are going to help me put this whole thing together? The cheek hairs curve away from the face and connect to the mane. Avoid parallels here. I mean, look how nuanced these notes are, right? And they're all based on forceful shape. A lot of the stuff is forced shape. Break in the muzzle line, right? Like being aware of that is, you know, you can see the eye is fully structured as to how it sets in there with the nose. These color separations li lines angle upwards towards the top of the ears, right? Notice, see, that's, that's another like, guide that's invisible to the general public that the artists are using, right? The tear duct lines up with the edge of the nose shape, right? There's a shape to a shape, but it's structural. The widow's peak lines up with the center line. Widow's peaks are like the saving grace of the art world, everyone, <laughs> okay? 
Widow's peaks are awesome because it gives you the center of somebody's forehead, which gives you the center and the structure of their head, and then comes down the center, down to the nose, down to the lips and so on, right? So you've got this nice center line in the forehead, right? Majority of animated characters have a widow's peak. Either that or their hair is usually parted to the side and then it's centered off with the center of the eye, right? But somehow you're trying to give yourself simple construction and you do that by making sense of where you put these, these structural lines, right? To make your job easier, right? So this is the secret sauce, right? This is what allows the better um, animation studios and movies to, you know, stay on model, right? It's just tons, you know, sheets and sheets and sheets, like a character, either Bible or style guide to understand how a character is drawn. The goal here is you want to create a guide that's strong enough for if I were the designer to hand it off to the rest of you out there and say, hey, you're the whole animation team. We're all going to be doing Simba and I've got to create the style guide, right? It's got to be good enough for you to be able to look through there and find all the answers you need to draw him. You already know how to draw, right? That's how you get into Disney, right? You, know, you needed to know how to draw. And then you have to draw well enough to have the ability to look at a set of rules and follow them. Right. And that's that's a trick. You know, that's a trick in itself. That's a challenge. Right. So this is the kind of stuff that helped us get through it. So I brought in with you um, some stuff that I had done in the past. I worked on a game called Ultima X a while ago with, where we did hundreds and hundreds of characters. Uh, this is a griffin uh, that I had designed. So the way this one started, this this page specifically shows roughs of mine. So here's me doodling out. You can see this is like version one, version whatever, version eight version nine, right? And I'm just like doodling. This is me iterating, just trying to find character design. And when I, we get to one that we really like, I kind of tightened it up into something a little more final. And once I had that, I created the orthographic projection, right? So that was the process there. This was the main character for the game, like one of the, one of the main characters. This is like a fighter. It was sort of like a Dungeons and Dragons uh, MMO. Um, here, uh, we did the same thing. We went through tons of roughs. Actually, what I think happened was, yeah, his name was Hank, I remember. You can see this is number two, honed. That means we went through a hierarchical approach of doing the character rough in many different shapes and orientations, different armor and so on. And then this was number two, honed means just cleaned up and tightened. Um, number two is the winner, right? And from that winner, again, orthographic projections are done, which these are mine, right? So we drew these. And then I did this watercolor painting of him instead of a digital one. I decided I was going to try to do something a little more organic. I wanted the rough dirtiness. So I did it in a more real organic way to get all this texture. And then here you can see there's some other notes of making sure we stayed thick with the armor. And, um, you know, here it says reused armor from honed. Like I was pulling stuff from other designs. You know, there's all kinds of like little notes and orientation around it, right? So this is the kind of stuff I was doing. And like I said, we did hundreds and hundreds of these. I worked on a game called Mech Assault at one point, which was um, mechs, right? And that was not fun. You know, like doing mechs in turnarounds with all these straight lines and angles and perspective and structure. Fortunately, my partner at the time handled most of those. And I did a lot of this work instead. Um, so yeah, so there you go. So there's some examples. So that brings me back to Baptista. I just wanted you to see this is what Baptista went through. Here's his character turns, right? That led him to drawing figures from imagination. You know, we talked about Lion King. Um, here is some drawings of Glenn's, um, Ratunjay actually brought in. Um, what's cool about these is this leads itself to exactly what we were talking about, right? Notice the notes. On the head, it says head. The shape should clearly show the top and side planes. So, to decipher this, he's saying shape should show form, right? So shape and form get combined to create Ariel's head, right? And notice this note, define the direction of the head um, by pointing, uh, pointing with the top plane. So he uses this very strong angle along the top surface to really create the structure of her head in, in, in perspective in space, right? So he's got this top and back. He talks about the eye line. He's like, the eye line's about two thirds of the way down on the head. That's pretty low. Normally a face is 50-50, right? With the eye line in the middle. So he's basically saying, I'm gonna keep giving her a big forehead and I'm gonna squeeze her little cheeks and her mouth and her nose lower on the face. And that's what gives her this really cute appearance, right? 
the head tapers to the chin. So you can see how it's wider at the top, like a light bulb, right? Wider at the top and narrow all the way down to this pointed chin. Keep the jaw lines definite, right? So all these little notes, you know, are, and these are simple ones, right? Nothing like the Lion King ones. This is him drawing and just jotting stuff down. He's probably handing it off to his animation team on Ariel saying, here's other things to think about as you really start animating, right? Just to stay on model, right? So again, this stuff gets passed around all the time in the studio. So going back to Baptista, right? This is Baptista's work. Um, hierarchically speaking, we start with the body, right? We're trying to understand like what the full proportions of the body are in the turnaround. And then we start getting down to the minutia, right? It's like, here is the character's face, right? And breaking down the face. You can see all these registration or extension lines to build this all out. Front view, three quarter view, side view. And then with the costuming on her, and I started teaching him this thing, we call the canvas construction here. You know, he's starting off with a square for the skull. So this, if he handed this to me, I can draw her, right? Cause look at how specific this is. Start off with a square, breaking down to the square, how it breaks down to the chin. Put this line in here to divide, put this line here to divide, right? This gets me down to where the eye shape is going to go and how it's broken down across the width of the head. You see, it's all measured out in basically in shapes. Like, it's not like you have to sit there with a ruler. Nobody's asking you to pick up a ruler. But you can, you know, as artists, we hopefully all can at least see when something is in half or in a third. And if you can get that far, then you can start breaking things down from those bigger divisions, like a pizza, right, to medium and smaller divisions, right? So he and I went through this giant process to get to exactly how her face gets laid out, right? And then you know, we were going into that to try and figure out, well, how does the nose and mouth line up to all that, right? What are some of the other rules? And we led, that led to the nose. And that finally led to something like the eye, like even the eye, how is the eye set up? So he's starting off with a certain proportional um, window, and then he's dividing the half into a half and then another half, right? And that starts to set up the curvature of um, her eyelids, right? and the size of her iris, you see what I mean? This was one of my notes. I was like, hey, maybe this is two thirds down is the bottom, right? From top to bottom, you go around two thirds and that'll get you to the size of the iris compared to the size of the eyeball or the opening that the eyelid makes. So it sounds all maniacal, <laughs> quite honestly, but this is how it works. And the more specific you are here, the better you're gonna be able to stay on model. And then you just gotta do a lot of drawing. All right, a lot of drawing with trying to constantly figure out those rules. And then over time, you probably end up getting to a place where it's simplified, like the last ones we just looked at on Glenn Keane's work with Ariel and the Little, Little Mermaid, right? Um, so last but not least, a couple of last slides here before I hand this over. Here's um, drawings of Flynn by Jin Kim. Um, I want you to see hierarchically again, this was a student drawing on top of these. Uh, you can see like the general shape and form of at least like the brow line, the forehead and the brow line and the chin, right? So big shapes in the side of the head. So that's where you want to start, right? Again, hierarch hierarchy, you want to start from big to medium to small. You want to understand those big masses. If you had to sculpt Flynn's head out of clay, you want to figure out that main mass first and how it's all going to work. And then slowly chop down shapes that have made out of forceful forms as you move down, you know, lower and lower into the rabbit hole, right? But this is sort of like a good general idea of the beginning. Um, I taught at the Academy of Art University in San Francisco for a few years, and I was teaching in the master's program, um, a character design class. I was drawing a character design. I don't know if Christian is here today or not, but sometimes he's here in the live chat. This is actually Christian's, um, from Christian's work. Um, at the end of the term, the student had to um, put together a uh, character style guide that was like the final for the class and here was christian's work on he had like this kind of caveman character and here's the work on the hand he did a really good job with this so i brought this in here to show you you can see he's showing you how it's built he has this interesting centered peak down the middle of the hand that he wanted you can see how the fingers are broken out into the different planes and shapes he's giving me proportion here it's like oh okay the knuckle is a as at a half right? So here's the full hand from fingertip to wrist, halfway is where the knuckle line is. I can get that, right? I understand it. 
he's showing here the different angles he wants and the knuckles, right? And if the skin is and how that breaks down. He's boxed out all the structure. He did the same thing for the feet. I love the footprint, right? Footprint is a great like silhouette, right? So that really works. Um, that really works well too, right? Side view of the foot and how he broke it all down and where the halfway mark is for the ball of the foot. Pretty good, all right? I feel like there's probably just about enough here for me to take it and see if I can manage my way through this and um, and see if I can recreate it, right? That's when you know you have a good character style guide or Bible is you can go in there, you understand all the information that the designer has given you and you can create this character, right? Okay. All right, almost at the end. Uh, this is work I did when I, I art directed a company called Leapfrog for a little while. Um, this was done by an artist named Chris Veer who was working for me and I was I art directed him through this project. And we had created um, a new character called Scout. So I was there for the creation of this and creating um, this uh, intellectual property and was there to try to go through the invention of how is this dog designed, right? And you can see all these like maniacal notes. I started us off really abstract, not even curves, just angles and points, right? And it says here abstraction, right? So this is the shape. And then it's like, how do you pull curves between those points to finally get to the line art, right? Here's the grid for the eye, just like I had Baptista do. And we took the muzzle, right? Muzzle's based on a, on a pentagon frame, right? So you can see this, the width of it, longer and shorter, right? Then you add the tip to it to get to this rounded shape. So you kind of billow it out. So we started with angles and points, very geometric, right? Lots of geometry. What works in the mouth and what doesn't work, right? And then the overall final, how you turn it in space, that it's not an ellipse, right? We had do's and don'ts. You can see what's right, what's wrong. So up here is what's right. And down here is what you don't want to do, right? I just want you guys to see like it's no accident when things stay on model. It's because somebody in the background has put a ton of effort <laughs> into this, right? And creating all these rules to make sure that that character stays on model. Abstraction of the body, abstraction of the tail, right? The spot on his back, right? Making sure he's not too long. Look at the angles, right? It's like seeing the geometry. He's too bulky. We don't want the chest too heavy, right? There's a certain triangulation that had to occur in his body, this abstraction that you round out to get the proportions of his body correct, right? And then we went into the paws. Again, rights and wrongs. You know, how is he actually built? What's the paw print look like? What's the general geometric shape? And how do you create form and stuff out of that, right? So, you know, and this doesn't happen overnight. This was probably a few weeks worth of work and back and forth and back and forth. And then me presenting it to like C staff and getting approval and coming back with changes and so on and so on, right? So this is what goes into it, everyone. So if you're out there right now listening and you wanna go do your own animated film or you wanna do a comic book or even a children's book or illustration, it's probably worth the time to at least get some kind of rough character or style guide together for yourself to get a sense of the rules around your character. Then you have something at least to fall back on and that's what keeps us true to form, right? Okay, last but not least, before I hand this off to Swenley, um, I just wanted you all to be aware that Swenley and I actually worked on a class at drawingforce.com based on this character Medusa. So we took a mythological um, you know, character that we both really liked. Uh, Swenley did all the work. I kind of played art director um, in the process of all of this. And we got to this um, to this final character that you see here. So um, yeah, if you wanna know the process we went through, which was pretty awesome. I think there was a lot of sort of new invention that we went through in there on how to design characters. And there's, like I said, a ton of videos in there that actually step you through what we did to get to this, this final result that you see here. So with that, I'm gonna segue over to, uh, to Swenley. So all yours. Yes, awesome, Mike. Let's see. Uh, I think you have to give me permission to share the screen, as you want to say. I do? Yep. Interesting. You're <laughs> locked out. Participants, Swenley, make a co host. That should do it. Let's see. Yep. Zoom keeps evolving on us. Yes. 
All right, so how to stay on model. Yeah, so thank you, Mike, for the great introduction. I think it's worth mentioning, like you said at the end, that you know, when you're working in production, especially, it's a team effort, you know, it's not a one man show. And it takes a lot of work indeed to, uh, to get the results that we end up seeing on screen. So um, to build further on what Mike spoke about, I was just want to give you like some tips and tricks that I've learned, you know, designing characters for animation and games. And let's see, number one here is to start simple, loose and forceful, you know, like uh, we have all the model sheets, of course, but the other aspect of it is if you like adhere too rigidly to that, then the characters can end up looking stiff and lifeless, you know? So I would say learn that stuff well enough so that uh, you can play around with it. You know, like this character, for example, this I call the Angry Force Baby, my ultimate character design. <laughs> and uh, um, notice how simple I started, you know? Super simple and quick sketches, like, and that's another thing, like Mike gave the example of the bowling ball. If you want to practice this, don't start with the most complex character ever. Start with something simple and, and practice with that. You know, like this character has pretty simple shapes uh, to work off of. You know, so I started with super loose and, and forceful sketches. And then I worked my way up to this uh, more cleaner uh, version, you know, and this took me around, I think, two hours and a half or so for these three sketches, you know, and especially when you're working in production with tight deadlines, like the drawings, uh, keep in mind, the drawings doesn't have to be absolutely perfect, you know, it has to be good enough uh, to, uh, to serve the production. Like, if you look at this character here, like there is room for improvement, but uh, the big picture ideas are there, you know, like the head shape, is pretty consistent in all of them, you know, like the, the limbs are simple four shapes. And um, yeah, so start, start simple, start loose. And we talked the previous weeks about the soft touch. So you don't want again to like jump right into the final product, you know, like um, I like to think about sculpting. I think Daniel brought it up in, in the chat. Like if you have to create this character out of clay, you can start by like copying contours or, or, or uh, shapes. You know, you start with a chunk of clay and you have to massage it and massage it until it ends up looking like uh, the character that you want it to look like. So start simple, start loose, keep it forceful and fluid and keep the character alive. You know, we don't want to, again, become so rigid with staying on model that the character loses all sense of energy and personality. And if you have questions, of course, feel free to state them in the chat. So um, yeah, there's room for flexibility. You know, and I chose this particular character to show you, uh, for example, if you look at the face, let me grab a brush here, like notice the different shapes in her mouth, you know, so the shapes were designed based on the acting, you know, the expression, you know, notice how different these shapes are, but it's still the same character, you know, so there is room for flexibility. Again, you don't have to be absolutely rigid and stiff. Uh, same with the eyes, like this is simple force shape, you know, straight to curve design. And here is the same, but it's a bit narrower to fit the uh, the expression. You know, notice here their eyes are wider, kind of surprised, but still an asymmetrical shape. You know, like the bottom curve is different. That this is a lesser curve to balance that. And um, let's see what more can we talk about here. So. Yeah, like the first character was slightly more, uh, it was more simple in its design and this one starts getting a bit more complex. You know, so you can build your way up when you're practicing. You know, and Mike talked about shapes and forms. I think I also have the, uh, the rough drawings here, let me see. Get rid of this. So this is the first pass, you know, notice all 
the work that went underneath. You know, I started with the uh, big, simple shape of her head, you know, filled it with structure. You know, this is center line, turning edge is about here. You know, this is round. So someone asked about the uh, you know, difference between shape and form. And here you see like on the notes of Glenn, you know, that we have a shape and the shape's design is dependent on the volume. You know, like if I, if I want to show like, of course we're looking up at this character, you know, and if I come and I draw the top of the head flat, for example, you know, then it doesn't work anymore because this is too flat, you know, and I want to come in here and add perspective, you know, I have to change this. I have to change the shape, the silhouette, to work with the volume that I want to show. You know, and other simple tricks like this line right here, this is the turning edge connecting here, so creating a clear plane. You know, this is the closest plane and this is the side plane. And um, all the basics of force still apply here, you know, like this has a clear sense of direction. You know, and here I thought, uh, same here, like this is the overall directional force of the head. And then you have this applied force here, like pulling it uh, backwards. Okay, any questions in the chat, Mike or Mitunje? Uh, no, just keep going, it's awesome. Okay, and the place where I, or the moment I would say where I learned this, you know, about the flexibility is when I was studying these drawings of Dexter, you know, from Dexter Laboratory. Uh, I got this from Google. I don't know who the artist is to give uh, him or her credit, but as I was studying and breaking down these designs, I noticed what, hey, notice the, notice what happens with the shapes of the glasses. You know, so the shapes are changing based on the acting. You know, like notice the drastic difference in the shape here. And notice here it's kind of angry, you know, so the, they use the shape of the glasses to express that, you know, and here it's rounds, but still all of the four characters are recognizable as Dexter, you know, so this was an eye-opening moment for me. So I was like, okay, so there is flexibility, you know, I can design the shapes based on the acting, like same for uh, uh, the legs and the feet here, like notice the drastic difference in silhouettes and how it's designed to express the, uh, the action, you know, the acting that's going on. And this is pretty simple, you know, straight to curve design. You know, and even the arms, like they stretch and they're squash, but um, so there is, there is enough I like basic uh, uh, rules and they're like from the model sheet, you know, to keep the character recognizable, but you want to balance that with the acting and the expression and keep the character alive while doing so. Right, let's see, number three. And I think Mike also mentioned this. So you can um, use positive and negative shapes to check accuracy. And especially when the characters start getting a bit more complex, like this character, for example, you have all these patterns um, on the tail and on his face, you know, so there's the moment where it helps to start seeing this as, um, seeing them as puzzle pieces, you know, so this shape right here is a puzzle piece, you know, and it has a certain distance from the eye, for example. So this, this would be like another shape in between. And as the character has like different expressions, of course, this, this the face is uh, flexible, you know? So as the character is squashing and stretching, you have to use your eye, you know, and just your sound judgment to like uh, estimate how much um, can you um, get away with changing those shapes without losing the character, you know, without it starting to look like a different character. Would you name this character? Sengxi, I think. Oh, yeah, it Sengxi. literally means messenger in Chinese, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really yeah, cool. I, so. I like that one a lot. 
yeah, and I remember the conversations you and I had about this one. You know, this mm-hmm. is like the moment where you were teaching me how to stay on model. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I remember yeah, that so, a while ago. It's cool. Yeah, this was in, it. yeah, back in 2017. So that's a while back. Mm-hmm. And these are the roughs. So this is how, how it started. And this is even the second pass. You know, if you notice, there is a like a lighter sketch underneath. And I started with simple shapes. You know, you can see all the form here. There's a center line and a turning edge. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a clear side plane here, same here. So I put in all the work, you know, so you're running on all cylinders. Like Mike usually says, you're working with force, form and shape. You know, so you let the, like the, the, the character acts as a whole, you know, so you have to like juggle all these balls at the same time. And here is where uh, good drawing skills come into play. You know, this is, that's the basis for all of this. Uh, when you, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> just uh, destroyed you a little bit. So when you're mm-hmm. doing like these rough passes, um, so let's say the negative spaces between the, um, let's say the eyes and that design that you have there. So do you mm-hmm. like really think about them? Is like, do you measure them? Like when doing like different angles? Because I think like that's a challenge, like to keep force alive, but again, to like make them correct in like different views. Mm-hmm. So is there something that you like measure or just like doing it out of your, uh, out of your observation? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, the key is to uh, work hierarchically, you know, so start simple. Like uh, I didn't start with the parents of the face. I just start with the, the big overall shapes of the character. And then I slowly add the smaller forms, you know, and that makes it easier, you know? So those yeah. details come last. And I, indeed, I just uh, measure them visually, you know, I just keep comparing shapes because uh, again, it's about the balancing act. You know, you want to stay on model, but on the other hand, you don't want the character to become too stiff and lifeless either. So uh, like uh, when a character is screaming, you know, you usually want to like uh, stretch the face so you have to be able to just like uh, uh, guesstimate in a sense, how much is uh, that shape going to stretch and um, without losing the character. Hey, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Reminds me, the, reminds me of the pizza analogy again, right? Like if, if the goal were to create a round pizza with eight slices, it's a lot harder to say, I'm going to make one slice at a time separate and see if I can make slices that match each other in size and make them all the exact same size. So I can make a full circle versus having a full circle and cutting it down into slices by going half, 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 half until you're down to eights, right? So much easier. So, you know, the mistake is to go, I'm going to make one pizza slice and then another pizza slice. (laughs) Right. And, try to hopefully get to a big shape that works, you know? Yeah, yeah, indeed. That comes back to the sculpting analogy. You know, you start with a big chunk of clay. You don't start like sculpting the sh- that little shape in the face. You know, you need the whole thing first and you slowly wait, work your way down to details, you know? And for those of you who are unfamiliar with sculpting, you know, maybe look some videos of sculptors on YouTube and look how they work, you know, maybe to help you like uh, grasp the analogy of working big to small. Mm-hmm. All right, let's see. So let's go to some turnarounds. Mike already showed some of those. Um, let's see, I think I had another character first. Uh, let's see, where is that? Hopefully Clip Studio Paint cooperates because it looks like it's hanging. Uh, Let's see. But in any case, with with turnarounds, you know, like this character was for a uh, video game. Now, so it has to be super precise in order to be built in 3D. Uh, Let's see, I think it's working. Yeah, yeah so this do. this was the character design. So this is how it started, you know, was approved by the art director. And the thing that was challenging here, which is why I choose this character as an example, was the design of the arm. 
you know, because I was like, okay, we, we designed this arm, but how am I going to translate that accurately in all three views? You know, and this was the art director's uh, idea. You know, he has this like, he had this like abstract sculpture, which he wanted me to use as an inspiration to design that arm. So this is how it started, you know, like Mike showed earlier, you start simple and the first pass is uh, mainly the shapes and the overall shapes and proportions of the character in front view. You know, as you can see, I drew the center line here. So, you know, like I roughed out the whole pose and then I just copied um, one half of it, like Mike showed and, and mirrored it. You know, and then I went to the side view and here again, you know, I applied all the force uh, basics rules. You can see this uh, uh, C curve right here. You can see the front to back happening in the leg. This continues here. Now this is the clear rhythm, you know, even in the design of the shoe. And then you have another directional force here, you know, so it's more designed, but it's all there, you know, and notice the directional force of the neck and the face, you know, so all the things that you learn in force figure drawing also translate here, you know, and the back view is more detailed even at this stage because uh, I did this one less, you know, like my showed earlier, you just have to like the silhouette is the same. So I worked on the front and the side view and then at the very last moment, I used the front view um, and the silhouette of the front view, I copied it and just like uh, drew the, uh, the back view into it. Let's see, so I have a couple of different stages here. So that's stage number one. And then I did a second pass, now working into some more details. So here I started to add the uh, clothing and here I added the hair and the belts and the jackets. So because the, the belt is an asymmetrical detail, you know, I, I drew this that later on, you know, so now the uh, like the main silhouettes and overall shape of the character has been established. So it's easy to come in and put in these little asymmetrical details. Let's see, this is step number four. Uh, it's odd that Clip Studio is like hanging. Normally it works pretty fast. But in any case, you just want to work step by step, you know, and again, start loose and, and fluid and keep it forceful, you know, so you keep a certain sense of aliveness uh, in the character. Uh, let's see. Okay, seems like Cliff Studio doesn't really want to cooperate tonight. Can't handle your characters, awesome ones. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's because my disk is pretty full. I think that's why it's lagging. But yeah, in any case, I see it's almost time. So hopefully this helped give you guys some insights into um, how to stay on model, you know, and you can, again, start simple. And the basic requirement is just knowing how to draw, you know, all the things we teach in force figure drawing uh, regarding force, form and shape and how to see a positive and negative shape and developing your eye, you know, to see proportions through shape and uh, design, you know, the bounding box, all those things come uh, into play once you start uh, doing more, slightly more advanced work, you know, like designing characters and staying on model or drawing them in different actions and expressions. Okay, I think I'm going to stop the share. All right, so we're going to close with, um, I wanted to illustrate what I was talking about before. Thank you, by the way, Swami, for that. That was great, beautiful work. Yeah, you're welcome.
So if, you know, my assignment to you was to say, draw a pizza. And what is that? It's, I want a circle and I want it to have eight equal slices. And that's the character design, right? It would be really difficult for you to say, okay, I've got to create this circle and I'm going to do it one slice at a time, right? Like, well, here's a slice, here's a slice, you know, maybe, and you know, you can see already this one is bigger, this one is smaller, right? So my size might be off on it. And I'm supposed to draw eight of these and I'm drawing, maybe I have another one that's over here and then one that's over here and I draw eight slices, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? And I do this and then I try to put them together. Chances are they're not gonna make up the perfect circle that was part of the job in creating this pizza, right? It's a lot easier to come in there and say, you know what, I'm gonna draw the circle and then I'm going, so that's my big shape, shape number one, then I'm gonna cut it in half, right? So now I have, I've done one slice, I've now made these two shapes, right? Then I do this, Right, so here, let's do it this way. I got one, two, you know, three and four, and then I can keep cutting and cutting, right? And get to, you know, five, six, seven and eight, right? So suddenly I fulfilled the job and I've gone hierarchically from big to medium to small, right? And that's what we're talking about today. That's a really big part of character design is understanding the big picture stuff first and then work your way down. It's forms, it's shapes, it's force, right? And to break your way down in that way. So hopefully you got something out of today's uh, session, you know, be aware of turnarounds and you can't be too particular, you know, make sure that you're seeing force, form and shape in your character style guides, um, go from big to medium to small. And by you creating your own rule book, um, you'll have a much better shot at being able to stay on model, right? While you're drawing. All right, guys, with that, we're going to close. We'll see you all um, next week. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Matunjay and Swenley, uh, for your help today. And uh, yeah, have a great week, everyone. We'll see you in seven days. All right. Take care, guys. Yes. Bye. Take care, guys. Bye bye.